This is Pod Populi, podcast for the people. The Great Love Debate. It's the Great Love Debate. The Great Love Debate. It's the Great Love Debate. Hi again, everyone. It's Brian Howie. Welcome to. The Great Love Debate, the world's number one dating and relationship podcast since 2015. I am back here in uh, the friendly confines of Santa Monica, California. Mm-hmm. I think I legally still live in Santa Monica, California. My driver's license says Santa Monica, California, but I have not been here in a long, long time. Um, I'm in a place called Tartine, which is a French word meaning tartine. Um, <laughs> and you never knew who you're going to run into. Uh, it's a lot of famous and fabulous people. Somebody who has been asked about many times. She has not been on this podcast uh, maybe in over a year, but she really? is why this podcast exists. She was a big-time TV producer when she started producing this podcast, and she's still a big-time TV producer, which is why <laughs> she hasn't been on this podcast. The two-time Emmy Award-winning Keiko. Hey, hey. How are you? Very well. Thank you for that. Have you been listening to the podcast? Are you a few behind? I, I, you know what? I got to admit, <laughs> okay. I've been so busy that I did get a few behind, but I uh, I live for it. So you know that. You're one of the Allie. most uh, positive people that I know. And uh, what I wanted to get into today, and I have an actual guest coming inside. Not that you're not an actual guest two-time <laughs> memory warning, Keiko. Um, somebody the other day sent me an email saying that, um, is it hard for somebody to date as a hopeless romantic. And I said, you know what, I've always been puzzled by the term hopeless romantic because hopeless is not a good word, but people who are described as hopeless romantic are sort of positively and in, in, in perpetuity romantic. Um, you're a positive person. Would you describe yourself as a hopeless romantic or would you describe yourself as I am a hopeful romantic? Definitely a hopeful romantic, but I got to tell you, Brian Howie, it is because of your incredible coaching over these years. Is this coaching that I'm doing? It's not, I don't know what it is. Maybe it's just me listening to you and saying, oh, wait a minute, that makes I'm sense. I'm just offering loud opinion. Okay, your loud opinions have helped me to People can do whatever they want with this different... Uh, let me rephrase it. Yeah. Your loud opinions have <laughs> helped me to become hopeful. Well, there you go. So, yes, thank you. Well, perhaps you will be the... Three-time award-winning Keiko by the next time we, we see you here. <laughs> yes. All right, go okay. about your busy right. TV you, life. It was good you. to nice see you, to see and you. the nice listeners will be happy. So I'm going to bring in um, my guest here. She's covering up her food. I She's am. like She has a big plate of food here at Tartine, which, as I said, means Tartine. Uh, it looks really good. I think you guys will be comfortable if she chews once in a while. That's fine. She's a podcaster herself. I believe she is a uh, somewhere between a hopeless and a hopeful romantic. Mm. She's got a lot to talk about. She's the host of the You're Such a Catch podcast. Erin Ramsey, how are you? Ah. I'm so happy to be here. This is so lovely. I this mean, is lovely here. At this is Tartan. lovely. And yeah. like, what are the chances that this like happened? Like, yeah, I want. To see, I've, you know, I recorded here connection. once before. Oh, I always have, want okay. to record face to face with people. Uh, and I don't it's have a studio better. here anymore. I used to have a studio here. So I'm like, you know what? I'm just going to sit among the people and let them look at us saying, what are those people talking about? Yeah, what on earth are they talking about? We're talking about love. So <laughs> you're such a catch. I imagine um, started as second person and moved to first person. In terms, does that make sense? Meaning it's something I believe that somebody said to you. Mm-hmm. Backhanded compliment. It's sort of like mm-hmm. I talked about on this last podcast. When, when somebody says... Um, why are you still single? I think it's a compliment. I think people don't say that of people that don't seem undesirable. Mm-hmm. Same with okay. you're such a catch. But yes. when they say that, there's always a catch. Mm-hmm. Right? Th- that's true. So yes. you somehow took ownership of that. I did. Tell me what that means. So what would happen is exactly what you just said. So people would say, oh my gosh, Aaron, you're so fun. Like, you're so funny. You're pretty. You're smart. And then you go, why are you still single? You're such a catch. And you know what? It stuck. And here we are. And I thought, well, let me get to the bottom of this. Why am I such a catch and still single? So I've been on a journey to, to kind of figure that out. To figure that out. Mm-hmm. And the journey always, I think, as we've said ad infinitum on this podcast, it's never that you haven't met the right person. It's almost that you haven't been the right person. Mm. <laughs> and people go, oh, my God, that's terrible. What are you saying? And I'm like, well, once you take ownership of your dating fate and the outcome, I think that's a lot easier way to date. 
It's a lot easier saying that I have some control over this, mm-hmm. and, and that's sort of the hopeful part of it. It's like if I'm in control and I take the steps and I do the work and I do all that, mm-hmm. there should be a positive outcome to that. Yeah. It's not just waiting around for the right person to call. It's not uh, you know misguided fantasies with Prince Charming and everything. <laughs> it's somehow <laughs> like, you know what? I am such a catch, and let mm-hmm. me try and solve the puzzle for myself. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. But it wasn't as easy to come, you know, you just kind of summed it up in about 45 seconds. Well, I've been like, doing this podcast <laughs> a long time. Yeah. <laughs> Trust me, if we go back to it the files, like it wasn't always like that. Years and years of, um, you know, uh, years and years of me trying to really figure it out. So I'm divorced. Okay. And Welcome back. Thank you. Okay. Um, but it's been a long time. So it almost doesn't even feel as if that was part of my life, if that makes sense. Any sort of yeah, yeah, I hear that a lot. So you went into marriage thinking you were fully capable of, of this. This was it. Did you were you like a happily ever after, or you're like oh, we've been dating and I think it's time to get married? I think that's what it was. It, you know, I was I was young and we had been dating for about four years, and all of our friends were getting married and they were starting to have families, and we were you know the only ones who hadn't taken that next leap, and so. I don't know. We weren't in a position to break up. There was nothing, you know. That's another thing. People, before people say you're such a catch, another thing they say is, when are you two going to get married? And it oh, gets yeah. in your brain. Right. It's, and then, you know, when we were married, then when are you going to have kids? Babies, and, yes. yes. exactly. It's like you're it's never okay and in the present moment, yeah. you know. So, yeah. So, uh, we dated for four years. We're married for three. And then one day, I came home from work, and he said, never forget it, he said, um... I don't want to be married and I don't want to have children. And I said, well, isn't this funny because I'm your wife and you have a child because he had gotten, you know, a girlfriend when he was younger, okay. pregnant. Yeah. And so, you know, that didn't, that plan that he so the had two things that he had, he didn't want. <laughs> right. And so I think I had, uh, a very outer body experience and I'm typically, um, call myself a recovering people pleaser. Mm hmm. But in that moment, I took it as an out, and I said, okay, then what are we doing here? Sorry, that's a buzzsaw in the background. (laughs) Hopefully that won't pick up on the mic. So if you're going to, that's literally, like, I think it's called a buzzsaw. Um, I feel like it's appropriate. It is. That was was not a sound effect that we put in to talk about the end of Aaron's marriage. (laughs) (laughs) So we dubbed that in. Keiko, did you put in a sound effect? Oh, Um, my gosh. One to ten, how shocked were you? Um, I mean, uh, mm, uh, that's a very good question. Um, if I put myself back there, I mean, maybe like a seven. Okay. Yeah. Maybe, maybe a seven. Yeah. Um, so the thing I had to work through is my grandparents were married 74 years Mm -hmm. until my grandpa passed or else they'd still be married. Like my grandma's still, you know, here. She'll be 98 next month. Parents just celebrated their 46th wedding anniversary and uncles, both sides still married. Yeah. So I was the first person in our family to get the D word. Well, well, (laughs) I I doubt that. (laughs) I think I said myself up for that one. (laughs) I doubt that somehow they were parents and grandparents. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, the other D word, the big old yeah. divorce. Yeah. Um, well, as I've said on this podcast before, my parents have been married about 50 years. I don't even think they like each other. So I don't know if that's oh. an example either. You know, that's Sometimes that you a different that. generation, people stay together out of mm-hmm. habit or they don't want to be the first to get divorced. Sure. So yeah. props well, to I you. T- I took that, yeah. You know, you know. it's a different time. Um, it, it takes a lot of guts to get out of a bad relationship and it takes a, a lot of work to get into a good one. Like it, it works both sides. So do you try and talk him out of this? I did not. I did not. And you know what I, the, the thing so you didn't think it was a phase. <laughs> no, no, I, uh, was actually quite surprised. I think, um, the next things that happened were really eye opening to me. So we had lived together in a few different places, um, during our seven years together and he had never made any sort of effort in, you know, back then we used to have to call in, you know, get a phone line set up and like set up cable and stuff. like yeah. he had never done any of those things. He didn't take the steps to he, make he had it never, a home. No. And so I like watched him. It's a rough neighborhood here in Tartine. <laughs> Santa Monica, California. They'll put that in the brochure. <laughs> Jesus. Okay. Go ahead. I mean, this is fun. Yeah. 
This we're, is exciting. We're among you know, the people. What's going to happen next? We have no idea. No. Um, maybe my future husband will walk in. Who knows? You never I mean, know. You never know. Um, but That's yeah. pretty handy with the buzzsaw. <laughs> You know. I haven't I haven't put eyes on him yet. I mean, I don't yeah, know. I don't know. <laughs> um, so <laughs> so <laughs> was any part of your brain like relieved? I th- I think because maybe. you're you're very lucky. Not props to him, but in a little bit. Good thing he did that. And not two kids and eight years yeah. into it, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. that he did it before, and he. That's probably a hard conversation for anybody to to have and to admit and to come home and say that right you right. know i mean, yeah. probably should have said it before you got married but thank you yeah i mean but it's okay i mean it's part of my story now and it's yeah, and now it's you have a story to tell right I, I do mm. yeah it's just a fraction of it but um yeah i mean of course like it it was a little bit of relief so through my work on myself and like this healing process and even having my podcast, I mean, I think the thing that I've come to realize is he really did me a favor and he gave me a second shot at right. love and at life right. because I probably wouldn't be sitting here now with you right. if I was still married. And no, especially he'd probably be mad. <laughs> <laughs> he probably would or right. jealous. Yeah. So yeah, everything, you know, second act, turn the page, move on. Easier said than done. Right. A lot of people, I brought up the, do the work, look within. Mm-hmm. The fine line and the challenge with all that is making yourself so self-reliant, self-satisfied, mm-hmm. independent that you lose the drive to bring in somebody else mm-hmm. where where you find the self-love and you find the contentment and you have your group of girlfriends and everything's good that you're like, I, I didn't leave space for an outsider because I'm trying to close all the walls down myself is that a challenge for sure (laughs) i mean you know you almost overcorrect right right so immediately after there was this common theme of don't make the same mistake twice right don't like is your picker broken like don't pick poorly um and I also feel as if i had lost myself in a lot of ways so if you asked younger aaron What's your favorite color? I couldn't tell you. I mean, I would probably have a thousand pink accessories on. Right. And you'd be like, duh. But I I couldn't tell you. I couldn't articulate. And you'd be like, what do you want to eat? And I wouldn't be able to tell you because I had spent the last seven years really catering to somebody else and being quite You probably knew his favorite color. Oh, of course. Yeah. Of course. That's interesting. And his favorite meal and where he wanted to go to dinner and all the things. And I don't even think I broke that. I mean, you know, you throw in a few other relationships and I mean... We might be like talking like Aaron has finally broken that like two weeks ago. <laughs> All right. Well, was there was there a, a light bulb moment? Was there a you can pinpoint it where you turn the corner? I mean, there were so so you talk about that independence and that really being reliant on yourself, and I think that's where I was. I didn't ask for help, and that's one of the things. If you were like, if you went through this all over again, what would you have done differently? And of right. course, hindsight's always twenty twenty. However. I think one of the strongest things you can do is ask for help. And I've learned that because, yeah. you know, um, that wasn't the case. So I thought I could get through my divorce on my own. Mm-hmm. And that was a terrible idea. Mm-hmm. And that's why um, a year after my divorce was finalized, my wedding photo still hung on the wall inside my house, you know, and my girlfriends had to have like a come to Jesus meeting with me like, okay, Aaron, walk me through this. So you're going to meet another man. And at some point, you're going to want to bring this man home. Right. And then he walks into your house and he sees this collage of gorgeous photos. Don't get me wrong. Gorgeous photos. But you're wearing this white dress and he's in this, you know, tux and you're looking over the cliffs. And yeah. How do you explain that? Yeah, that's yeah, good that's question. a tough one. Yeah. So they all came off the wall right after that, and I kind of got over that. Were you still in communication with him? No. Are you in communication with him now? No. Do you no. want? Do you care? Are you curious? No. Are you poking around I, social I, media? I, n- absolutely not. Not even with my most recent relationship. When you're no. done, you're done. When I'm done, I'm done. Mm-hmm. I, I, actually, when you're done, you're done. Once the wedding photos come down off the wall. Well, yeah, true. I, but you know, so I had looking, also probably still been paying for those at that time. You know what I mean? That, like, oh, that's true. I was getting my money's, money's worth. worth. <laughs> yeah, but um, so that when you had to go back out there, yeah, were you 
quickly rushing back out there because you wanted to replace other than I know you have the wedding photos on the wall did you want to replace the mm. feeling that being married had or were you scared to go back out there because you're like I can't trust anything because my my judgment's bad my picker's broken all of that mm. um, I I didn't even really have an opportunity uh, I Im- almost immediately fell literally like fell into another situation that was not a very good choice um Ter- terrible choice, might I say. And I was in that for the next four years of my life. Oh, wow. Mm-hmm. And that was very, I, mean, I can't even say the word, tumult- you know that one? Tumultuous. Thank you. Yes. Traumatic. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So um, it, I... I didn't even, I mean, I hadn't even explored, like, I don't even know if apps were a thing then. So my app experience didn't actually start until I moved to the LA area. Um, and where I lived when I was married was, I lived in Temecula. Okay. It was very, you know, suburb. I lived on a cul-de-sac because we bought that home so that we could have kids and our kids could play with the neighbor's kids. And, you know, the rooms in that yeah. house that I stayed in oh, were supposed God. to be filled with kiddos you know what I mean and that didn't happen and then I found myself in this other situation um and you know sometimes I even read back like my you know I'm I'm very um introspective and I like to write and I I like to journal and all those things and so when I read back some of my journal entries from that part of my life what I see is a very very broken sad you know, um, woman who didn't recognize her self worth or what she, you know, what what she had to offer. Like she was so worried about everybody else that mm-hmm. that's where that recovering people pleaser comes in. We hear this all the time. Mm-hmm. It's such a common thing, and we probably hear it more from women because women are going to try and open up. At least a lot of the men shut down and they walk around angry or sad or broken forever sometimes they don't take that step it, it does take uh, tremendous confidence to be vulnerable yeah. to yourself and to others it's, mm-hmm. a, it, it's a challenge when did you get interested in enough in your own journey that you're like I'm going to both do this publicly but try and share it and yeah. help other women yeah that would have been um, in 2019 so in 2019 and a little bit before that I had I'd moved to the South Bay in 2015 as a means to um, leave that other situation and you know my my dad gave me some really solid advice he says you know you never run away from something but it's fine if you want to run towards something right and so I you know took that to heart and I worked with my mentor I had at the time like my professional mentor and he helped me really manifest this job that brought me here um, but then it was like a whole new world right because the apps and I was in this new environment and I felt like it was a younger crowd and oh my gosh like this is my opportunity and I still thought the answer to finding you know the right person for me was outside of me but that wasn't it you know and it probably wasn't until a season into my podcast after I had had on a bunch of dating and relationship experts and coaches that, you know, sometimes someone would give me really solid advice. I mean, I was basically right. getting, like, free coaching, right, right. by having people on my show. <laughs> and But also, like, sharing it right. with everybody else. But, you know, then sometimes people would give me some advice and I would think to myself, oh, God, you know, like, <laughs> like I don't agree with that, you right. know. And I had um, gone through an experience, too, where, uh, which is probably a story for another day, but I had hired a matchmaker for some time. Because, again, you know, everybody, oh, my gosh, Aaron, you're so wonderful. Right. You're so great. Why are you still single? Right. Um, but then I had this, like, really, like, Oprah aha moment, I call it, where... Like, how can I, how can I expect somebody else to fall in love with me if I'm not in love with myself? And if I don't love the woman I see in the mirror, whether she's, you know, got a couple, you know, wrinkles on her face or, you know, right. a couple of extra LBs from COVID, you know, like, like you have to fully embrace and truly unconditionally like love her. And so that's really where my, my journey pivoted. Good. All right. I'm here with Aaron Ramsey. We're going to take a quick break because we got to pay for uh, fancy places like Tartine, and we will be back right after this. 
And we are back. We took a quick break. She didn't take a bite of her food. She's very disciplined. Very <laughs> monastic here. It looks so good. You're welcome to take a bite of it. They will know, not. Like, they would take a bite. The listeners would take a bite oh of it. My gosh. Take a bite. I will. Uh, you well, have. Uh, okay. I will work around your chewing. It looks too want, good. What is want, that? Do locks? You, do you want one? No, two. I don't know what it is. Just it, start. It is, just start. Smoked starting. Smoke salmon. See, it's sunny out here. You don't want to leave smoked salmon out in the sun. I know, but Eat don't it. Don't you think I need to use a, a knife and a fork? Go knife? ahead. Okay. I'm going to hold your mic while you do that. I'm going to give play by play for you. She's so. She's like, how quickly can I do this? Well, I don't want her to choke. Although that would be interesting. Heimlich real time on the great love debate. That would be good. Um, so moving yourself, you know, a lot of people do do that, which is fine. I always say, I said it about this podcast. I say it about all the podcasters that everybody's job is to raise questions, not necessarily provide answers. And the very act of raising questions for yourself, for others, with guests, whatever, has huge, huge value because you're basically being curious. And curiosity will lead to passion, and passion will hopefully lead to drive you in the direction of some answers and restore hope. What was your low point? Uh, uh, had you lost hope? Like, why isn't this working out for me? Either after the second relationship that was tumultuous and traumatic, was there a point where, like, because that is the, always the challenge. Once people see the hope, they usually can take the steps to head towards, the, you know, as your dad said, moving towards something. It's hard to move towards something when you have nothing to move towards or you can't see to move towards. A lot of people, you know, they're happy to walk down the path if they can see the path. Yeah. I think that's one thing that has always... Um come quite easy for me, which is seeing the glass as half full and just approaching life, no matter what it is, um, with a positive outlook, you know, always finding the silver lining. Um, so I've never given up hope. And I mean, I wish I could tell you right now that, you know, I manifested the perfect person and, you know, or whatever, like right. the story I told you right before we started recording, but you know, that hasn't happened yet, but I still believe it will. And yeah. I'm open to any which way it finds me or I find it. Yeah. It only takes one. Exactly. And who cares it, about it, the right. first one? It only takes the, 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 the yeah. next one, which is hopefully the last one. Exactly. And that's what people should, should do. Mm-hmm. A lot of people are so busy looking backwards, which there's obviously mm-hmm. some value in that to see how you got to this place and see what mistakes you made. But some people focus too much on that and they don't look forward and they don't look where the possibilities are. Now, you moved into the Los Angeles area, South Bay in particular, which um, it's not the easiest place to date for a couple of reasons. And people are like, yeah, everybody's beautiful and it's hard. The geographical challenges, the traffic is a hassle and people mm-hmm. are lazy about dating here. When you're in a warm weather place, there's no sense of urgency because the we- every day seems a little bit the same. Mm-hmm. You're in a place like Chicago and you're like, uh-oh, summer's over, winter's coming, I better find a boyfriend. <laughs> that That's a real thing and people really do make decisions based on that. Here, you might be like, oh my God, I got to drive 20 minutes. I'll drive 20 minutes for a deal on a desk at Ikea, but I won't do it for a date. <laughs> and that's the way people think mm-hmm. and that makes it not necessarily the easiest place to date despite the fact there's a lot of lovely people here Mm -hmm. i don't have a problem with the traffic um i will say in the beginning i had some misconceptions about how to set up my dating profile so i would only set it up for let's say a five mile radius yeah i can't do that here. no you can't now what i will tell you is the last man i dated lived 14 miles from me Mm mm-hmm which in L.A. took me anywhere between 45 minutes and an yes. hour and 15 minutes. Right. And I never once complained, nor did he, about going to the other person's, you know, area, respective right. area. Because it was worth it to us. You know what I mean? That spending the time together, it was worth they it. They were and worth I was, 14 miles. Right. Wow. <laughs> yeah. And Flattering. <laughs> but you 14 know I mean? Los Angeles miles. <laughs> yeah. The other thing about that is when people set their geographical preferences, there's a good chance you're going to hit a bullseye of somebody driving through your neighborhood that happens to be in your five miles and then they actually live two hours away and then you fell in love. Well, (laughs) you know, I live very close to LAX. Yes. Oh, yeah. So you're either getting pilots or travelers. Yeah, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. So so caveat emptor on on relying on that thing. Somebody Mm -hmm. could be there for, for... so, really. 
getting one, gas in your neighborhood. And at one point, <laughs> I think during COVID, I uh, opened it up to like the whole country. <laughs> I was just like, who cares? Yeah. You know what I mean? Who cares? Like people make it work all the time. Like it's, it's all about effort. And like, again, when you find the right person, I think mm-hmm. you're willing to put forth the effort. So, yeah. yeah. Some people, I, d- I did a show in Atlanta and, uh, a lot, one of our live shows and a woman stood up and she's like, everybody I swipe on is just passing through town. And I'm like, well, get them to stay or go with them. Like I wouldn't automatically just rule that out. Mm-hmm. People click on cruises and yeah, tourist trips and, uh, you know, conventions and stuff mm-hmm. all the time. Yeah. So yeah, maybe it's a little bit more challenging and maybe, you know, they're going home to their wife and kids and you probably don't want to hook up with them. <laughs> but there are possibilities and to just rule it out like, oh, no, I live in Atlanta and, and I right. live in Dallas. Well, yeah. you didn't always live in Atlanta and they didn't always live in Dallas. And people move all the time yeah. for a lot worse reasons than falling in love with somebody. Mm-hmm. Amen. The podcast. So yeah. you decided, like, I'm going to talk about this. Mm-hmm. Sort of doing the work out loud in real time. For abs- absolutely, you can see. Did the people growth. <laughs> say to you like, "Why are you doing this?" Or do you have a lot of naysayers, or people are like, "Why are you? Don't you have to f- have all the answers first? Because trust me, we hear everything around here. Oh, we do. Yeah, I mean, probably the only person who was a little concerned was my mother. <laughs> you oh. know? like, like Aaron, should you be doing this? Should you be really like? Does she listen? Every single episode. Every single episode. Mm -hmm. And I try really to be um, cognizant not to um, withhold or not to, like, you know, keep certain details out because I know that. Right. Um, I think, if anything, this has been a good lesson in, you know, your who you are Mm -hmm. and I want to be authentic to that and if my mom doesn't like something like you know she's still gonna love me I mean she's my mother you know what I mean and I think it's actually brought our relationship closer because now some of my decisions and some of the things that um, have happened make a little bit more sense when she has that I mean there's so much insight out there which is a little bit scary I will tell you because my last relationship he knew exactly how to be, who to be, what to be. Because, because you gave him the playbook. Absolutely, yeah. Mm-hmm. I don't think that's a bad thing. I, I mean, unless he's not, unless he's, you know, disingenuous about it. But if you're, ding, ding, ding. you know, if you're, it's not bad to leave the notes on the fridge of what you want. And this is sort of, you know, doing a podcast is sort of leaving the notes on the fridge. Yeah. That people should know, you know, if you're like, my favorite color is blue and you said it on the podcast and then he bought you something blue. That's not necessarily a bad thing because you said it on the podcast. True. That information's fair game. I agree with that. <laughs> and I think, so the only thing that I learned through this, though, is me sharing, like, my list of what I want, you know, and I'm giving to the universe to deliver to me. Okay. <laughs> Wrapped in a bow. It's easy for somebody to kind of step in and know exactly who to be, how to act, what things to kind of isn't that e- that seems easier but if that's not their genuine authentic self so what if he's trying if, if you're like listen i like a man who wears i'm looking for a man who wears tuxedos all the time mm-hmm. and then he wore a tuxedo all the time even though he'd never worn a tuxedo in his life is that a bad thing no, but it's when he stops wearing the tuxedo because he never wanted to wear it in the first place. Oh, so he he did he, enough to get the job. Uh-huh. And then was like, yeah, okay, revert bad. back to. Oh. Mm-hmm. That could happen anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Well, in the first, uh, you know, 60 days of dating somebody, you're really only out with their publicist. True. You, you yeah. know. <laughs> and I'm trying to get quicker about that. Yeah, you got to you know get what a little mean? quicker I'm trying to get about a little that. bit quicker. And, you know, when uh, I see a pink flag... I'm going to be like, okay, there's a pink flag. And then I, I think, see the red flag. I think the more open somebody is with what is wrong with it, like the more aware of they are. And they're like, you know what? I'm, I'm probably going to, I'm late a lot. I'm trying to oh, work I on it. That, yeah. yeah. But mm-hmm. a lot of people are so afraid to, oh, mm-hmm. they're like, well, maybe if she'll never notice if I don't say anything, you know, mm-hmm. it's a fine line for everybody to be, you know, or if somebody's like, I always date this type of guy. And then they're going to be, you know, they're either going to be that kind of guy or the opposite of that kind of guy. True. Everybody's just flailing in the ocean here. I don't know. I, it's amazing we ever get together at all. Um, the most interesting thing you've learned through having these conversations publicly, either about yourself or about the dating universe. 
Oh, the most interesting. Or thing that surprised um, you. I think probably how resilient I am. Um, you know, and I, I mean, it happens, right? Like, I'm sure you've experienced this. Like, at some point in time, you get a hater on the podcast. Just somebody doesn't. No, never. <laughs> never had that. Somebody. I love it. You know, and it's like you have to go through these things, right? And it's and it kind of goes back to that glass half full, um, you know, positive, like find the silver lining approach. Because when these things happen, it's all about perception and how you want, like, do you want to internalize it? And yeah. is that person speak for everybody? Or do you really like they're having a bad day? This is more about them. And you Listen, just if I moved it. you enough that you're going to fire off a 200 word email to me, good. Yeah, Good job. Well, like Very it. happy yeah. with that. Yeah, I don't care. Yeah. I mean, it's the same in dating, right? Yeah. <laughs> you know, you're going to get rejection. You're going to have people who ghost you. You're going to have people who, um, you know, you go out on a, f- you you have two or three fantastic dates and then all of a sudden, you know, whatever happens and you're not their person and you're like, whoa, you know, it takes, t- takes the, um, knocks the wind out of you're, your sails a little bit. You're right. And, uh, you know, we are in the heart of uh, La La Land here. And, and one of the things that the very best actors and actresses that I know that helps them turn the corner in their career is when they realize that if they didn't get the part, it doesn't mean that they weren't talented. Mm -hmm. It just means they weren't necessarily right for the part. And that is really hard. When you hear rejection and, and Hollywood is full of rejection, it's where no happens for everybody. And you kept hearing, nope, nope, we'll call you. Thank Mm -hmm. you. Thank you. It's really, really hard to still believe in your ability and believe in your talent. When the actors and actresses turned the corner and it was, and they're like, it just wasn't a fit. And that can go the same thing for having a job interview where you go for a job and you didn't get it. Well, you just weren't a fit. And same with a relationship where you might have thought it was a fit. And if they're three dates in, they decide you're not good. Yeah. That is a lot easier than 10 years and two kids. Amen. And, they, and a mortgage and they come home and they're like, you know what? This wasn't yeah. a fit. On to the next, mm-hmm. and there is always a next, um, and you got to believe that. Like the, the, you went on somebody a date with somebody, it was awesome for three dates, and then you're like, oh my god, this was the one that didn't work out. It wasn't the one. Wasn't the one. I agree. And you know, um, after I got out of my last relationship, because I did believe that he was the end game, uh, I divinely met this woman. You know, like kind of how you and I are sitting here, just things happen exactly how they're supposed to. And she told me about the parable, um, with like your plastic set of pearls, just basically like if you continue to cling on to your plastic set, you know, the universe or God or whatever you believe in can't deliver you the genuine, the real pearls. Right. Yeah. And I took that to heart and really started examining not just in love and relationships, but like other areas of my life, like where am I clinging to my plastic set of pearls and right. why am I clinging to this plastic set and not opening myself up for what's truly could literally be right in front of me because right. I'm so fixated on whatever it is. And I've really tried to, you know, examine that in situations. So if I do go on three dates and the guy's like, by Felicia for me, then it's like, okay, don't cling on to it for another two weeks, Aaron. Like, you know, feel the emotions, allow yourself to feel because right. I do believe in that right. process through that and then let it go because your genuine set is still out there. And the longer you cling, you're right. So don't dismiss the experience mm-hmm. or the opportunity. Appreciate the opportunity. Didn't work out and then move on for it and recognize yeah. there's another opportunity. And I'm sure there's a lesson in there because I, every relationship I've ever been in, mm-hmm. there's a, one lesson, if not more. <laughs> I mean, you know, the the, the very um, super introverted me does not learn these lessons the way I should. But people who are who value every conversation and every interaction and think, what can I I learn from these people? The people who talk to the Uber driver, not me. I'm like, please don't talk to me. How is the this pe- a thing? The people who you don't. Oh my god! I wish there was a default setting where it's like, don't talk to me. No, I'm Why? like your worst nightmare. Yeah, like, I oh, am your worst are you the nightmare. one on the plane who's like, so where are you headed? Yeah, and then we're best friends, and ten no. years from now we're like meeting in like Cancun. No, your way is right. I'm totally wrong. I get that, but I will take the stairs rather than risk being in the elevator with somebody because they might talk so to me. Funny. Yeah, it's not a healthy way to live at all. The the people I know who who derive the most from every day, every situation, every encounter are the people that are fearless in their encounters, and mm. they are like. 
I'm glad this person is sitting next to me. Mm-hmm. I want to pull up a chair. I love the communal tables. This place have a communal table? Probably mm-hmm. does. Worst nightmare. I'm oh like, my oh my gosh, God. that's so funny. That's like my favorite <laughs> pastime. Right. Your <laughs> way is right. Yeah. So I'm aware of that. And I'm aware it's something that, that there's, there's work to do. Um, you know, I've had businesses where I'm like, I hope nobody comes in. That's a bad business. Right. You should want people to come into your business yeah. and yeah. come in. So, yeah, that's me recognizing that that's bad. And the people like you, the Uber drivers, like, how was your day? Good for them. Yeah. Uber drivers out there, don't ever say that to me. But I, I realize that, that you're right. I will fake my headphones all day long. Um, <laughs> but learning from an encounter and being positive yeah. about it and looking forward to it, it, it you know, that's a really good thing. But you, and you have to turn the corner. Going through that experience, the multiple experiences that you went through. The scar tissue is actually healing in a way. It mm-hmm. does make you stronger and it does mm-hmm. do things. But in the moment, that's tough to tell somebody. Yeah. No, it is. It yeah. is. Um, so, but when you remain open, like I'll give you an example of what happened last night. So last night, um, my friend and I went out to dinner and we were down in San Diego and we didn't make a reservation because why would we plan ahead? <laughs> I mean, Mm -hmm. (laughs) who are we? And, you know, we could sit at the bar freely. So we thought, well, that'll great idea. Right. And he and I, he's more of an introvert, but through me, he'll open up and have conversations. Right. And everybody is my best friend after two minutes. So, um, so we sat at the bar upstairs and immediately befriended the bartender who was fantastic. Like got his number was like, I am throwing a party just so you can come and like, be the work bartender. right oh. but i'm like, gonna have a party you want to come mow my lawn yeah that's not good for him oh my god he was all about oh, okay. it he was all about it but um at one point you know and i'm i like to be super present so you know my phone's not out or anything like that i'm talking to my friend uh looking to my right and he goes i think your husband just walked in and sat at the bar and i like you know a few seats down and so i casually you know did one of these and looked over and I was like, Oh, he very well could have, you know? Yeah. And so then the next things that happen are just, you know, you, you have, I find them humorous, but like, I don't find them coincidental. Okay. You like, went because- and spilled a drink on him. No, good no, 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 no. But like, you know, a group of women came up and they had had a few and they were kind of bothering him. And so he scooted over next to me. Mm-hmm. Okay. And so then it became, you know, like a conversation, you know, like back and forth between, both guys and you know i mean before i knew it i knew it was like political (laughs) views i knew you know uh a lot about how his upbringing and his family all the things right he was not from this area he was from up north Uh and um i thought wow you know like it all it takes is one and who knows and then you hired him to check coats at your party (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> no, I didn't. Did you get his phone number? Did you get your phone number? So here's the thing, and I would love your take on this. So obviously great time. Um, at one point, I did have the bartender take a selfie with all of us, including the bartender, because I loved him that much. Right. And um, didn't want. I wanted to remember that moment in like its beauty. Right. And so he asked me to airdrop it to him. Okay. And I did. So he had the opportunity to say he texted to me. He didn't. But before the evening, because I am can sometimes be very much of my masculine energy. Right. I just said, hey, like, you got to take my number because we need to connect and hang out again. Right. And so I did. I, I did that and he did. And he I, did? He did. Okay. Yeah. So you didn't say, give me your number. You said, you need to take my number. That's, I did. That's yeah. fine. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And I need to text so him back. So airdropping doesn't share... The phone DNA can't track. No, it, doesn't. it just it just adds that photo of us into his camera roll. Yeah, but bet you Apple knows who both of you are of from that course, intersection. Yeah, though. um, good. That that's good. That's not nothing. Well, we'll mm-hmm. see what happens. We'll see what happens. I mean, the day's not over. No, he's ten years younger than me, but whatever. He doesn't oh, know that. Jeez. <laughs> doesn't matter, right? Age is his number. Oh, it matters. Oh, <laughs> depends on the age, I suppose. Um. I read somewhere that you're a Los Angeles Charger fan. The number one. Well, there's Self-proclaim. only three, so it's not that hard. I'm still I have the one. lived here for a long, long time. I, I've sometimes said I could go a month without seeing anybody in Charger gear here. Oh, you're breaking my heart. I know, but you're aware comfortable. of that, yeah, right? Of course I am. Yes. How do you become? Were you a San Diego Charger fan? Yes. 
Mm-hmm. So you're one of the ones who, because most people in San Diego down there, they're like, they're done with them. They felt dumped and they bailed. Right. Because it's not that far. They could drive up and go to that they really could. nice stadium here. Right. Yeah. They could. I yeah. used to drive down there and go to the not so nice stadium. I, I know. You know the what I mean? was nice here. No, I went last year. I'm a Giants fan and I went to the, the Giants Charger game. Oh, um, yeah. Chargers are good. So but you're not, you're, well, you're not, you. you're not bandwagon, no. you know, but, no, I'm but a travel with the team kind of gal, but there are, yeah, I like that too. But there, you know, there's 32 NFL teams. You will probably see 29 jerseys of other teams before you will see a charger Jersey, which this is weird in this town. It must make them. Um, and even when you're there, it's weird that the other team has more fans. Yeah, I think I've just come to recognize that that's a circumstance I cannot control. Yeah. And um, so here's something about me, too, which I think is a great quality. I'm very loyal. So I'm not going to jump on, you know, the Rams won yeah, the Super Bowl, Rams right? Yeah, Super Bowl, you're not suddenly... No, yeah, and the colors you. are the same. But half yeah. my closet is, is Charger, you know, blue and yellow. And I like to bolt up. And, um, you know, if I could meet a man... <laughs> If I could meet a player, I mean, we've we've been down that road too. But if I could meet somebody who shares that love and that passion for football, like yeah, yeah, they like, train in like Thousand Oaks or somewhere, right? Like they they train Hills. right now in uh, Costa Mesa, but they oh, are they Mesa. just broke ground in El Segundo. Oh, so, very close yeah. to you. I mean, yeah. So, well, but the dream you know, lives. <laughs> Probably date a coach. I know. That's what everybody tells me, I guess, because I'm aging out of the player world. Um, yeah, that doesn't even make you old, but they're done at like 29, a lot of players. Right. And I, so. I need a player without CTE, so. Yeah, that's yeah. true. Yeah. <laughs> no. Careful what you wish for. These <laughs> ladies want to date an athlete. Right. Um, all right. In the interest of time, I'm going to let you plug the podcast in a minute, but this is your first time on The Great Love Debate. We play something called Worst Date or First Date, which means you have to give us either the greatest first date you've ever had or the absolute worst date you've ever had Mm -hmm. your choice um i'll give you the the worst date i've ever had um met him on tinder uh he picked a spot in manhattan beach for us to go he picked mb post which is a really nice restaurant yes it is i used to live in manhattan beach it's awesome you did okay oh my gosh we like it's the best yes it is the best um so we went there, uh, date was going well, conversation was going well. Um, he elected to, um, you know, ask if I wanted to grab a drink after. So I said, sure. So we mixed the vibe and went to my favorite dive bar, which I'm sure you can guess, Manhattan Beach. Do you know it? Shellback? Of course. Yeah. yeah shout out to Rico. <laughs> <laughs> terrible that I because there's a lot of bars there but I did nail it good <laughs> yeah you did I have uh, every hat they sell there in every single color um, it's like my favorite dive bar ever so I was like let's go there and I bring all of my dates fun fact there um, so Rico can give me a thumbs up a thumbs down or wow. a thumbs to the side he knows me that well and um, so we went we sat at the bar he ordered us two more drinks and he um, paid for them so he had paid for dinner as well and um, then he said to me, I need to go use the restroom. And I said, no problem. And so he went and there were two gentlemen sitting to my left in uh, your worst nightmare. My favorite thing to do is, you know, introduce myself, see how their night is going. And, you know, they ask me, you know. Wait, you couldn't wait for this guy to come back? You're already on to the next dudes? Well, they were they were gay and fabulous. <laughs> oh, okay. and I, I mean, I, if <laughs> okay, I could pick up a straight man, like yeah. I can pick up a gay, like hello. True. Okay. But so I just, you know, um, started a conversation, and um, anyways, I I kind of kept looking back, you know, like is it like what happened to him? Where is he at? Thinking maybe you know something didn't sit well with him, and yeah. like that bathroom in Shellback, like. They need Sketch. to kind of, yeah, yeah, yes, exactly. And so, um, you know, also just, you know, try not to be weird and like watch the clock like while well, he's going yeah. potty. And so um, finally the guys say to me, um, so, you know, who are you here with? And I was like, oh, you know, the guy next to me, we're on our first Tinder date. And I'm like, oh, the guy who hit the ATM machine and bounced out the back door about five minutes ago. And I was like, What? And they said, yeah, he went to the ATM machine, grabbed cash, and went out the back door. So my only logical explanation for this is that he shit his pants and had to leave. That's the explanation? (laughs) Yeah. What's the cash for? I don't know. Pay for a taxi? Well, had he already paid for the drinks? He did. And he paid for the dinner? He paid for the dinner. So he didn't stiff you with the bill? No. So I went outside because there was... Drugs? I don't know. And then he got killed? This might be... No, he's alive. And here's here's how I know. So... (laughs) 
So I went outside because the reception isn't always good in there. And I tried to call no answer straight to voicemail. So I shot a text and I said, Hey, what happened? I thought we were having a good time, whatever. And he said, you're a very sweet girl. Like I wish you all the best or whatever. And then said, well, I came out the bathroom and you were talking to the guys and I, the gay guys that were on a date yep. next to us and he didn't like it. So that's fine. He's not my person, right? You let him go. Funny enough, I get some sort of, you know how like sometimes we subscribe to things where you get like pinged on dating and relationship stuff. So one day I open my phone and I get pinged on this little article and lo and behold, this woman has reviewed three men on different apps that she's met and gone out with. He was one of them. She had met him. It was the same profile picture, everything. She had met him on J-Date. Yeah. Yes. And um, had very similar sentiments as I did about the date. I won't say what she wrote, but I'll send it to you so you can read it. She put his picture on there? She did. It was in Pop pop Sugar or something like that. Is that okay? I don't know if that's okay. I don't know if that's okay either, but she did. I have a lot of questions. Please get this guy on the phone. I don't know what happened. I don't want to know what the cash was for. Me too. Because he risked you seeing him get cash, like go yeah, to the ATM. I, yeah. And I did kept, I'm telling you, I kept looking back, but then I also was like, you know, we've all had a situation in which, you know, we might've had a little gurgle in our belly. And like, if you're on a first date with somebody. You better eat that salmon. <laughs> You're right. Or I'm going to have a gurgle I, in my know, belly, girl. right? We'll follow up with what happened with the salmon. <laughs> uh, all right. Plug your podcast and whatever else you want to plug. Oh, my gosh. Where can so all these sweet. people find yes. you? Everybody can find me at You're Such a Catch. Um, that's my social media handle. So it's Y-O-U-R-E. Yeah. If you spell it without the E, you're not such you're, a catch. Yeah. You're not going to find <laughs> me either. E for Aaron. Remember that E. And yeah. Um, yeah. My podcast is available on Apple Podcasts, all the fun podcast players. And come join me, ladies out there. If you want to be part of a community, I got a community too, and we support each other. So, yeah. Do you buy Y O U R such a catch for the dumb people? I don't, but I probably you should. should. Yeah, Redirect. I should. That's yeah. a good tip for Thank you. Thank you. That's <laughs> solid business advice. I appreciate that. <laughs> you always gotta. You always gotta uh, account for the misspellings. Amen. Or somebody yes. who Google's it wrong. It's going to come up. Uh, this was fun. Thank you for doing this. Thank you wherever the uh, two-time Emmy Award winning Keiko blew in and blew out of here. She's very busy, apparently, <laughs> winning Emmys. Um, as far as us, as always, like, share, follow. Please review this podcast. Your reviews mean a lot in the podcasting ecosystem. Shoot us an email, greatlovedebate at gmail.com. Questions, comments, thoughts, or uh, please surmise what exactly happened with Aaron's date. We'll do that. Check out our live tour schedule, greatlovedebate at gmail.com. I don't know what shows I have on there. Probably doing the Great Love Debate, so you could see the information on there. I do owe some places a show. I owe Boston, Massachusetts a uh, show at City Winery. They are calling. It'll probably get back on the calendar at some point. Because, as always, at the Great Love Debate, we never stop making love. See you next time. <laughs>